the lady who designed this, I think this is brilliant. And I'll be talking on some of this. For instance, you're looking at a stone where Nebuchadnezzar wrote about himself in Bab Ilu, Babylon. Bab in ancient language means gate. Ilu, the god. So Bab Ilu means, or Babylon, the gate or the way to the God, to salvation. And then, this is what Loretta and myself saw when we got onto Ucht Asar. Ucht in ancient Armenian means mountain. Asar, uh, Asar, Ucht Asar means the mountain of the covenant. We'll tell you more about this when we visit Armenia and uh, share with you what we discovered there concerning the landing place of the ark. This is what we found on top of Ucht Asar. Now a man by the name of Heruni, the greatest scholar in Armenia today, said this is a representation of the fall of man. More about this in a later lecture. You know, if you want to build something, you need tools. And I want to leave a few tools with you as you study the Bible. And I pray that you will develop a greater appetite for the greatest literature that's ever been written. I've studied a lot, but nothing compares to the Bible. One of the tools that you need in studying this marvelous book, whether it's small or big, is typology. Typology means, and Jesus gives it to us, in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 6 he says, somebody greater than the temple are here. So the temple with its message is small, but Christ is great. So whatever you study about the temple should point you to Christ. And then, that's typology. He also says somebody greater than Jonah is here. Yes. Jonah is a prophet, a very popular prophet, a type of the antitypical Jonah, Jesus Christ. And then he also points to King Solomon. And he says, somebody greater pointing to himself than Solomon is here. So all the prophets, all the priests, and all the prophets of the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. He is the central theme of the Bible. Now there's another tool that you can use we call it soterology. That's a big word, eh? Soterology. But it comes from the Greek word soter, which means savior. It says that Noah found favor in the eyes of God. That's great. And when you study the Bible, see if you can find salvation. Because we need it. We need salvation desperately. And then there's a few others like merismus. A merisma, you find a merisma right in the beginning of the Bible. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created heaven and earth. Two poles which tell you about the totality. He created the universe. You also find a merisma in Psalms 138 where it says he knows you're sitting down and you're rising up. So in between is your life in totality. Merisma, it's wonderful to, to have these tools as you study this book. And another one we'll be looking at, hopefully, is called the chiasm, 
chiasm. It's a Greek word which says a lot. For instance, I live to eat, or I eat to live. I live a to eat, B. I eat, B, to live, A. And the entire book of Revelation is designed in this literary fashion. It is fascinating to study the Bible with these tools. And then the last one, and this is the one I'll be concentrating on, is archaeology. Archae means ancient. I'm a representative a representation of antiquity, as you can see. Arche, logos, logos is signs, the word, the word of ancient things, the word of the saviour, typology, the word of type, anti-type. And the reason why I love archaeology, because it is a signs that look for worthless stuff. Can you imagine people digging meters deep to find a lot of broken pottery? <laughs> but to me, this is the gospel. There's another archaeologist. His name is Jesus Christ. He works through all the rubble to come to my brokenness. And then he takes the pieces. And he glues it with his love. And I become whole again. So it's not so much how you fell in sin, but how God put you together again. Seeking for worthless stuff and give them new meaning. Now you're looking at a very familiar sight. Those who've traveled abroad, we call this a hill or a mount. This one is, is unexcavated. And once they've excavated this mount, something exciting is going to happen. Now underneath this hill lies a city begging the archaeologist to discover a fascinating story. I've just been to one of the tells called Tel Dothan. And I so wish that people would just start digging there. Because it's a, it's a marvelous story, Tel Dothan, where Joseph was sold for cheap. They got a bargain when they bought him. And on the Tel, Elisha and his servant woke up one morning. And what did they see? Enemies. And the servant was so worried. And Elisha prayed, he said, please Lord, open his eyes. And so he saw chariots, mighty angels. Those that are with us are more than those against us. So as archaeologists uncover these mounds, they come up with tremendous, exciting material to help us to believe God a little more. He knows how skeptic we are. Now can you guess the name of this city? It's an unfair question. This is in Turkey. It's not far from the city of Laodicea. And a letter was written to this church. It starts with a K. Colossi. Yeah. There's the name. Paul wrote them a beautiful letter. If you need this encouragement, just read the book of Colossians. Now, this is a place I visit regularly. Chasor. In Hebrew, you don't say Hasor. They cannot say Ha. They only can say Ha. Chasor. Chasor. And there you see them busy digging. I met some students from Andrews University there and one of their professors, Hazel, brilliant young 
archaeologist. Now, what is the archaeological name for these ancient mounds? Can you tell me what they call these mounds? Can you tell me? Tell. Yeah. <laughs> now, Joshua 11, for instance, 13 says, Yet Israel, and two days ago, I was at the place where the name Israel was born. Can you perhaps tell me where it was born? At the Jabbok River. His name was Jacob. In Arabic, they call it Nar el Zerka. Nar is a river, Zerka is green. Joshua 11, 13, yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds. And Hebrew is Tel. So a mount in Hebrew is Tel, except Hazor, which Joshua burned. So here it says that Joshua burned Hazor. The Bible says it was burned. The Bible says many things, but uh, how do I know that this is authentic? Can archaeology confirm what the Bible says? And this is what I love about archaeology. I've spent my life visiting sites, seeking sites, researching sites, which are mentioned in scripture and it confirms the authenticity of that book. If you want a new inspiration, new visions, read that book. There is the old man without the beard. This is a brand new beard by the way, it's three weeks old. You think I'm doing well. I think I still have to catch up with uh, some of you, but I'm holding in my hand a piece of burnt pottery from the time of Joshua. The Bible says he burned the city. Archaeology says yes, it happened. The Bible is, is true. It's such a wonderful book. What do you see? Look at this. You know, different stones. It looks like a big mess. Sometimes I feel like this. A big mess. I need an archaeologist. More than ruins, yes. The spade of the archaeologist is resurrecting the inspiring stories of the Old Testament. It comes to life. I've just been with 15 men of the cloth taking them on an archaeological tour in the Holy Land. And they tell me that they feel already that the Bible is going to be a brand new book to them. Join me on a journey to the Fertile Crescent. This is a term coined by an ancient archaeologist, Breasted. And they use this to explain the civilizations. There you have it. We're going to start at Sumer, up with the Tigris and the Euphrates, called Mesopotamia. It means the land between the two rivers. Up, up, up to Haran, Nineveh, and then to Egypt. So that the Fertile Crescent starts at Sumer and ends in, in Egypt. And this is where Abram left Ur in the Chaldees, and this is where he walked. And I did research on every site he visited. Hopefully, I will be presenting some of the material research to you. Breasted, as I said, coined uh, this water rich area, the Fertile Crescent. You cannot travel without water. And you cannot travel through the desert of life without Christ, the water of life. Now, clay tablets with strange writing called cuneiform from Uruk in Mesopotamia. 
Can you read it? It's, it's mysterious, isn't it? In my old age, I started to study Sumerian and I discovered it's a marvelous, marvelous language. There are many different kinds of cuneiform. Uh, not even the most brilliant scholar could read these mysterious writings. They saw it, but they couldn't read it. It was a mystery. Just look at this. Different figures, different uh, little stripes and stars. And what do you make of it? In many instances, the Bible was the only source mentioning ancient cities like Nineveh and Babylon and many others. So we had this in the Bible, but the Bible was the only source. Josephus, Fluffius Josephus, also mentions some of them. But how can you believe it? Is this true? Myths or facts? Well, I took this at the Bergamon Museum in Berlin. When I took my friend there, Walter Feit, I usually taking on some of these archaeological discoveries, and he's growing in this field. He's not very bright in this. I've got to teach him. But uh, he's a brilliant, he's my best student. Anyway, he's getting excited about archaeology. I said, Walter, bring it into your lectures. It's going to make it even more attractive. Now, what messages were written here? Somebody took a chisel and chiseled this in rock. What is the message? Was there pain in the author's heart? Was he discouraged? Do we have uh, facts to, to build our faith on? Who was the author? When did he live? You know, people looked at this and they, they didn't know what was going on. Now, would God allow the skeptics to mock the authenticity of the Bible at infinitum, forever and ever? No, at the right time, he gives the answer. So if you've got a bit of a mystery, God's time is always the right time. This is Loretta. She's been with me now for 15 times. I ask her, would you like to inherit one day or would you like to enjoy your life now? Guess what she said. Now, <laughs> young people want the kick now. So there's nothing to inherit, but she's got a lot of wealth up here. Now, like Mesopotamia where Abram lived, Egypt too was an ancient civilization, magnificent. And of course, like the Euphrates, the Nile provided a fertile soil for plenty of food. And you can go to most museums, they've got something about Egypt. And by the way, they reckon there's another million mummies to be excavated in Egypt. This is the tomb of Tut Ankh Amun. Tut means Tut, the image, Ankh, life. Amun means the, the main god in the pantheon of Egyptian gods. I'm going to speak more about this man because he changed his name from Tut Ankh Aten to Tut Ankh Amun, in the living image of Aten. And we're going to look at monotheism, the worship of one God, unseen creator God. But uh, there's Loretta standing. Are you ready for a journey into Egypt? Let's explore this amazing ancient land. And the Lord left all the monuments and all the hieroglyphics for us to enjoy today. Guess what I'm holding in my hands? 
a mummy. A mummy. It's not allowed to handle mummies. But I got a man with an old puja, the back wheels were buckling, and his price was right. So I said, let's go. <laughs> so he took me there and he, he grabbed the mummy. And I held it in my hands, and this is Walter Fight holding it in his hands. Now, does the Bible mention mummification? Yes. Uh, which father and son were mummified in Egypt? Jacob and Esau. I've got a very intelligent uh, audience. Thank you. Now, entrance to the tomb of Pharaoh Senefru. I like the story of Senefru. And in the series on the 18th dynasty, I want to come back to Senefru. The man who didn't give up when he made a mess of his first pyramid. He kept on building pyramids and his son, Khufu, built the largest one at Giza. He watched his dad. Rest if you must, but never quit. And perseverance is the master of defeat. So if you feel like giving up, Senefru says, don't give up. <clears throat> now, thousands of people before me entered here, but they couldn't read these uh, hieroglyphics. By the way, they had 2,300 characters, more than our alphabet. So to read hieroglyphics takes a long time. You're out of high school. You haven't learned anything, everything yet. Here, Loretta is standing at Tel El Amarna, the ancient capital of Akhenaten, who built a capital here and he called it Akhetaten. His first daughter was Mekitaten, Meritaten, Anken Senpaten, and Nefer Neferu Aten. Ending on A-T-E-N, telling the world that we believe in a God which cannot be seen, an unseen creator God. It's a tremendous research, which makes me so happy when I, I study it. So we will be looking into this as well. <clears throat> now, would Egyptian hieroglyphics ever be deciphered? People saw it, but what does it mean? Uh, Karnak Temple, Luxor, it used to be called Thebes, the one capital, the other one was called Memphis. The Bible has so much to say about Egypt, Mishraim, but they couldn't read hieroglyphics. Uh, would the hieroglyphics ever confirm what the Bible said about this great civilization? In Daniel 12, there's a prophecy which says that knowledge will increase. Not only of the book Daniel, but also in other spheres of life. Now, for many centuries, the Bible was the only source that mentioned uh, Tyre and Sidon and the Cedars. The only source. Could this info be verified? People were skeptic. And they said, no, we cannot trust this book. There's no scientific evidence that this is the truth. Now, when the war against the Bible was at its height, God stepped onto the battleground field and the science of archaeology was born and the authenticity of his word triumphed. Ah, oh, this, is, this is great. The Rosetta Stone was discovered by the French. Right on top you've got hieroglyphics. In the middle, Demotic, and at the bottom you've got Greek. Three different languages telling the same story. More about this when we do the 18th dynasty. But at last the key has been found to unlock the secrets of Egypt. And Jean-Francois Champollion worked 22 years to decipher the message of the hieroglyphics. Today, you can read it for yourself. Half a moon is the T. So you've got one letter. Tut, Ankh. The Ankh 
looks like a key, means life. So you've got two. Do scholars supply us with a date? I'm referring you to Unger Merrill, Merrill Unger, brilliant scholar I'm using his material. He says, modern archaeology may be said to have had its beginning in, this is an interesting date, 1798. When the rich antiquities of the Nile were opened up to scientific study by Napoleon's expeditions. By the way, Elamitic cuneiform were deciphered in 1844. Interesting dates. At last, information concerning the reliability of the Bible just began pouring in and people could read what it says. By the way, hieroglyphics is a writing used only by priests and pharaohs. Commoners like you and me couldn't read it. It means holy writing. The Bible is true, says the hieroglyphics. How many years, by the way, did Jesus spend of his life? Ten years. A third of his life. He only went back when the, the Herod died. So Jesus could read hieroglyphics. He was a brilliant, brilliant scholar. He could speak the language. So he was acquainted with the pyramids. So when you visit Egypt, you walk on the footsteps of Jesus. It says here in 1 Kings 14, 25 and 26, and it came to pass in the fifth year of Rehobiam. The Bible is very specific when it comes to dates. Fifth year. That Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Can this be confirmed? This is what I like about archaeology. As this is an inscription made by this very same pharaoh, Shishak. Uh, it tells about the expedition into Judah. Here's the story. It confirms the biblical account. So you read it in Kings, and you read it in hieroglyphics on the walls of the Karnak temple. And he gives a little extra info. info. He captured 46 cities. Names of the Israelite cities and Jerusalem which Shishak conquered. Now, it's interesting when you look at, at these ancient reliefs, you notice that some men have got beards and some don't have beards. These were the eunuchs. Daniel was a eunuch. Every person who worked in the palace of the king was a eunuch. Archaeology does not prove the truth of the Bible. It merely confirms the truth. Now, the Bible mentions the Egyptian princess who adopted Moses. And I did research on the Egyptian calendar and the Hebrew calendar. And this is, this is an amazing discovery, journey into the history. Where, so when I read about a pharaoh, I know exactly where a biblical figure comes in. And it opens a new world. It's so rewarding. Now this is the three months old fetus of Hatshepsut's mother's womb. Hatshepsut is in her mother's womb. There's another one where she is six months old. And she who went down to the Nile to worship. The Nile's name is Hapi in ancient Egyptian. 
happy Moses. Moshe means born of, taken out of. So the name of Moses originally was happy Moses. Found in the Nile, the god of the Egyptians. Now, I've put a question mark here. Who's this king? Tat Moses III. He died in 1450. And this is amazing. I'm going to tell you more about this pharaoh who died at the exact time when the exodus took place. So we've discovered the pharaoh who drowned in the Red Sea. This, this is great. Your Bible becomes alive when you study this. Uh, the stairs invite you to visit his unfinished tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Giza. Exodus 11.5 And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of the Pharaoh that sits upon his throne. Did this happen? You don't find this in Egyptian annals. They never mentioned any, any trauma or failures. You don't find this in ancient Egyptian language. It's out. So you've got to try and find the truth through the lies they tell you. Now, when you look at the Sphinx, and whenever you go there, you'll see something between the paws of the Sphinx. It speaks of Thutmoses the Fourth. He was out on a hunting expedition. He came back, he fell asleep in the shade of the Sphinx. And then he heard the voice of the god Harmakis, which says, if you remove the sands from my paws, you will become the next pharaoh. This is a lie. This is trying to, to argue away the death of his older brother because he was the second oldest. Is this how one becomes a pharaoh? No, you've got to be the firstborn. But the firstborn died and he says, I'm the pharaoh now because of what I did. The lie of the Sphinx confirms the truth of the biblical account of the 10th plague. I'm going to tell you more about the father of Tutmosis IV. How he reacted when he came back to Egypt and all the Hebrews, the Habiru, were gone. And his son died. So the lie of the Sphinx confirmed the biblical account. This is Memphis. The Bible speaks about Noph, one in the same place. Uh, what did the Bible predict of it? It says the, the images of the gods would disappear. The luster and the beauty of Memphis would sink away into sand. And uh, Ezekiel 30, 13 says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will destroy the idols and put an end to the images in Memphis. There's only a small area where you can see a few pieces of excavations. But the city, the mighty Memphis, with all its gods are gone. We call this polotheism. What the Bible predicted about Memphis is attested by archaeology and history. This is all that's left. The mightiest city of antiquity disappeared. The former glory of this once mighty metropolis and the idols are gone. The Bible is true. Tarnas is quite an interesting place to visit. I've been there a few times. Ezekiel says, 30 verse 14, I will lay waste upper Egypt, set fire to Zoan, and inflict punishment on Thebes. That's modern Luxor. 
Zoan is another name for Afaris, the ancient capital of the Hyksos. Fire? Yes. Archaeologists discovered the evidence of a fire that burnt here. Did this prediction come true? Yes. Now this is the ancient site of Zoan, also called Afaris in the Na Delta. Now I want to tell you, it's not easy to research these sites. Loretta and myself got police protection and they battled to find the site because Bitak, a professor from Austria, identified the site, he excavated and then he put the sands back. He took all his pictures, you can see it in books. But here lies ancient Afaris, the capital of the Hyksos where Joseph came and worked for Potiphar. You know, when you walk here, the stories just flood your mind, and it's so beautiful. He was sold by his brothers at Dotan. Here, Mrs. Potiphar fell in love with him, and he landed in jail. But eventually, he landed on a throne. It was destroyed by fire, just as the Bible predicts. That Moses III died 1450, he started his reign at 1504, died 1450. Loretta is standing on the steps. It's the largest tomb in the Valley of the Kings. I want to tell you about Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti. The only pharaoh who built his tomb on the eastern side of the Nile, rejecting the immortality of the soul. He speaks of the sleep of the soul. You cannot afford to miss the coming lectures. Uh, this is a Kuduri. Kuduri, strange names, but it's good to learn new things. Nebuchadnezzar's throne name was Nabu. Kuduri Usar. Nabo is the son of Bel Marduk. Kuduri means boundary stone, and Usar means an important person. So the name Nebuchadnezzar means God protects my boundaries. We've got another God who protects our boundaries. Greater than Nebuchadnezzar's Balmarduk. But this is a Kuduri. I discovered a few more in the British Museum, which I'd love to show you. Uh, you've met this lady before. Have you seen her before? Nefertiti, the beautiful one. Some scholars say she comes from Armenia. Her complexion is, is, is more light than the ordinary Egyptian ladies. Both she and her husband became monotheists. Mono means one theist God, Theos. People who believe that there's one God which you cannot touch, which you cannot define. You can never define God. He's above definitions. And uh, polytheism, the worshipping of many gods, brought their gods down to a piece of stone or a snake or whatever. So they broke away from polytheism, she and her husband, Akhenaten, and they started to worship the invisible creator God. This is a great story. It's coming. And here you have a, a family picture. All the pharaohs tell how great they are. You see them on a chariot. But he speaks about relationships. There he sits with a baby on his lap. Akhenaten, Nefertiti, with Mekitaten, Meritaten, Anken, Senpaten, and Nefer, Neferu, Aten. And above them, this interesting symbol. The sun pours out life 
right in front of the nose is the ankh. That means life. So he says, I get life from above. I don't possess immortality. I get it from God. Aten, as they called him. And at the end of the other sunbeams, you have a, a helping hand. I like this. Some scholars think he got this from the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. But they came, became monotheists. So Moses had a tremendous influence on the pharaohs. And I want to discuss this with you. Three of them became monotheists. Mighty columns at Karnak, ancient biblical themes. Who destroyed the city and when did it happen? Uh, look at this. A king and a lion. Have you read about Daniel and the lion's den? The critic says it's nonsense. For 3,000 years, these monuments were buried under the ground. This is from Iraq. And now it comes to life. This hunt is depicting Ashur Banipal, the last great Assyrian king. Thebes was destroyed in the second Assyrian invasion of Egypt by Ashur Banipal in 663 BC. Bible is true. Corridor at Karnak, the Hebrew prophet Nahum, by the way, the, the little town Capernaum, Kefar Naum means the town of the prophet Nahum. The Hebrew prophet Nahum declared shortly afterward that this destruction of Thebes was a type of the destruction Nineveh would suffer. A prediction. Did it come true? Yes. Now certain scholars doubted the authenticity of the book of Daniel. If only someone could decipher this wedge-like writing, would God solve the mystery? Can he solve my mysteries? I've got a few mysteries. You've got a few. Can God solve it? Archaeology says yes. Deciphering this strange script looked so impossible, but eventually Bible prophecy was fulfilled and knowledge concerning the Bible-related cuneiform was revealed. Now in Egypt you had hieroglyphics. But look at the cuneiform script. It looks different. This is an inscription of Nebuchadnezzar, which you can see in the British Museum. Now before Rawlinson, Englishman, decide with cuneiform, the Bible and Josephus were the only sources who mentioned his name. People were skeptic. Now you've got it. You can read it, you can touch it. Upper Dharma at Persepolis, Loretta, you've got to dress like this when you visit Iran. Not even your toes are allowed to be exposed. So a man falls in love just with your eyes. That's all. <laughs> but it was quite exciting. I did research on the, uh, the Persian king, Cyrus the Great. What a story. I want to tell you about him. Join us on a fact-finding mission. At God's appointed time, Iran released the secrets held by cuneiform writing for thousands of years. And at this appointed time, he will also explain your perplexities and mine. I've seen it. Just wait a while. He will explain it. Not at your time, but at his right time. Where was the secret released? Over there at Behustin. Let's go there. Uh, Rawlison discovered the site in 1835. Because of what was found here, cuneiform was eventually deciphered, which was also a grammatical miracle. 
What an experience to stand with your only child for which you've prayed for nine years. Man, it's, the Lord is so good to me. So good to me. It's a historic sight. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Daniel said, knowledge will be increased. We will have to come back to the Behustin Rock. But you can go in, in, on the internet and see it for yourself, read it and get the message. Now, the best relief portrays Darius, there he is, holding a bow, sign of sovereignty, and treading on the chest of a figure who lies on his back before him. That's cruel, eh? Below and around the bas reliefs, there are around about 1,200 lines of inscriptions telling the story of the battles Darius waged and then the date against the enemies. This inscription is written in three languages. God is so, so kind. Not one language, but three languages. And it helps us to decipher these ancient scripts. So there you see the rise. He's mentioned in the book of Daniel. 2,500 years ago, someone impressed Darius, and there he is, to write the same story in three languages. No one knew why, but today we know. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see some inscriptions here. This is at ancient Nineveh. It relates the story of the destruction of Nineveh in 612 BC by the king of Ecbatana called Asteach, sorry, Seacheres, Nabopolassar, and his son Nebuchadnezzar. Nahum prophesied that Nineveh would be destroyed just as Thebes uh, was destroyed. And it happened. The Bible is so accurate. Nahum 3.8 Are you, Nineveh, better than Thebes, situated on the Nile with water around her? The river was a defense, the water's a wall. And then, it's all gone. You're looking at the dunes of Ashdod. I'm just touching on the landscape, the archaeological landscape, uh, at this stage. Isaiah 20 verse 1 mentions an interesting name called Sargon, king of Syria. And the critic says, Sargon? No ways. It's impossible. Where does the Bible get the name from? But, when the Bible says something, you can believe it. Even if you read that all your sins can be forgiven, you can believe the Bible. Uh, the Bible wants to show his face to us. His face is never frowning at you. His face is looking in love towards you. Guess what? They discovered a palace of Sargon II at Korsabat, the ancient Dur Sharkin. Dur means uh, protection. The protection of the ancient king of Sargon. He conquered Samaria in 722 and exiled the ten tribes to Assyria. The Bible is true. This is the original relief of a line on the procession way in Babylon. I took this picture in the Berlin Museum. Critics rejected the fact that Daniel wrote the book, this apocalyptic book. Reason the future cannot be predicted and the Aram Aramaic is not from his time. You just have to wait a little longer and the Bible will be confirmed through archaeology. They made a fantastic discovery here at the Elephantine Island at the Aswan Dam. 
where they checked the Aramaic with the Aramaic of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel starts with Hebrew, chapter 1. And then it goes to Aramaic till chapter 7, 8. And then back to Hebrew. Daniel is a marvelous book. I've just completed an entire series on the book of Daniel with its chasms. Chapter 2 and 7 belongs to one another. 3 and 6, 4 and 5. I get so excited when I look at the book of Daniel and Revelation. When you study these books and you look at this, the grammatical structure, it becomes so plain, so exciting. Okay, the Bible is true. God allowed the science of archaeology to be born at the right time to strengthen the faith in the Bible. There's a tremendous war against the Bible. I'm sorry to say it, but it comes from our universities. And I was researching the truth of the Bible when I met a young man called Walter Feit, and I said, Walter, come and help me. Let's work together, and we're still working together. Telling the world that there's no book like the Bible. If you read it, you'll get new courage, new dreams, new vitality new energy. All the customs of the patriarchs are recorded in the ancient records confirming the accuracy of the Bible narrative. Uh, maybe you recognize this civilization, these people. It's called the Hittites. And for many centuries, their existence was denied by the brilliant scholars. Oh man, they are so brilliant. But then the archaeologist with his spade came along and something happened. With the absence of facts uh, last forever concerning the Hittites, no. They were studying these monuments and they looked at these strange writings. In God's own time, a new strange writing was discovered. Could this be Hittite? Poor Bible scholars. They were fighting against these brilliant scholars. But if you believe the Bible, you will be brilliant and the others will become fools. There are so many fools. I've got books. If those men could be resurrected today, I wonder what they would say. Look at this. <clears throat> more and more discoveries were made in Turkey and Syria. What were the chances that this could be Hittite? At last, a German by the name of Bossart in 1947 came to this interesting place, Karatepe, in Turkey. Never before have archaeologists seen Hieroglyphics like this, it's not like the Egyptian hieroglyphics. It's, it's different. And they looked at this. Could this be Hittite? It must be Hittite. Guess what? He discovered a Phoenician inscription next to the hieroglyphic inscription. And they started to compare this. But this is hard work. Uh, listen to this incredible story where you can see God's hand in history. One afternoon, Steinherr, he worked with Bossart, attended a lecture where Bossart discussed part of the Phoenician text in which there occurred the phrase. This is the Phoenician text which could be read at this time. And I made horse go with horse and shield with shield, and army with army. That evening, Steinherr worked until late at night. At last he went to bed exhausted, but in that state of mental excitement which often carries over into dreams. I believe this is divine. Suddenly he awoke, sat up, 
and saw with the greatest clarity before his mind's eye a piece of the hieroglyphic inscription in which there were two horses' heads in succession. Phoenician, horse, horse, hieroglyphics, two horses' heads. This is, this is marvelous. He also saw the sign for, I made, which up to this moment neither he nor anyone else had detected in the context to make happen to be the one known verb in hieroglyphic Hittite. What was the Phoenician text Professor Bossert had discussed during the afternoon? And I made horse go with horse. The Karatepe inscription was certainly a bilingual. Someone impressed the author, Asita Vandas, to write the same account in two languages. The deciphering of Hittite hieroglyphics call with a loud voice, God's word is true. Believe it with all your heart and read it with a passion. And then Ucht Asar. Asar means mountain Ucht, the mountain of the covenant. Uh, this is what we're going to have a lecture on. And we're going to drive to this exciting place. What do you see? Itzachar, it's called. Petroglyphs, the oldest in the world. What do you see? A road leading out of the desert. You cannot make a road in the desert, but God can. He can help you out of your mess. Are you looking for an exit from your desert of guilt and pain and meaninglessness? This is the book. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way out of the desert and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You will find that road by reading your Bible. And his face will become so beautiful to you. Please see his loving, kind face looking to you with compassion, with sorrow, with love. Thank you.